How painful is it for you to revisit that accident in your mind? It's not a painful experience now because there's so much good that has come out of it. So much joy. So much joy? Mm, absolutely. Three beautiful children, knowing who I am. What knowing mean, what's important, getting perspective in life, being able to give something back, being able to help people. I feel so incredibly grateful for the experiences that I've had. Mind you, I, don't, I wouldn't want to have to go back and <laughs> do it all again. A lot of the hard work <clears throat> has been done. But there's uh, good things that come out of everything, Peter. Kerry Packer, mm. when he died the first time, mm. said there's nothing there. I bet you he regrets that now. <laughs> but he's not here to ask. <laughs> That's because he's there. <laughs> You're quite convinced there's something there. I know there's something there. I've been there. Well, what was it for there's... you? Well, I had, you know, I had, I, had, I had people there with me. I had a conversation. I was given a choice. Do you want to stay or do you want to come back? I didn't want to come back, you know. I mean, there was a, a time when I was... Pretty angry that I did come back. You know, this is, I don't want to come back to this body. This is not my body, but it was my choice. You know, I made that choice. And that's the choice that we all have every day of our lives. People don't realise that they make a choice every day. How do you know this wasn't delirium working? Because I know. It's a knowing that you have. You know, I trust... I trust my intuition. I'm not trying to convince any, anybody. It's not, you know, it's just the way I live my life. But, of course, the objective reality was that the life that you'd had was over. It was over. You know, driving along in a bus that says Prince Henry Spinal Ward in my wheelchair. Hmm. That was tough. And then when you did get out, inevitably you go into a big depression. I did. Well... You know, they warned me. They said, this is, you know, expect this. And I thought, no, 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 I'm getting out and I'm going to learn how to walk. And, you know, I got home from hospital and, you know, I, I lost so much weight. I probably weighed, um, oh, geez, about 40-something kilos. There was nothing left of me. I was in a wheelchair attached to a catheter bottle. I couldn't walk. I had a body that didn't function. And, yes, I, I did plunge into depression and thought to myself, you know, why, why did I have to survive this accident? I don't want to be here. Everyone, had, all my friends had gone off overseas skiing and racing and look at me. What do I have in life? I can remember actually being on my knees next to my bed and almost saying, OK, God, if I'm here then please give me some sort of direction in life because there isn't an awful lot I've got to look forward to at this point. I guess that created a whole shift in my attitude in that I thought to myself, you've got to find something to replace everything that you've lost. When I got home from hospital and I was in a wheelchair and a plaster body cast, an aeroplane flew over and I thought to myself, well, if I can't walk, then I might as well fly. And I was lifted into the aeroplane for the first time. And when I took the controls of the aeroplane, I knew this was something I could do. I thought, I can fly. Within two years, I was a commercial pilot and an aerobatics flying instructor. Flying gave me my life back. I love the sense that I don't have to have normal legs to be able to fly an aeroplane. You know, I'm mainly using my, my hands. I love that sense of three-dimensional flight to be up there and soaring amongst the clouds. But the ultimate to me, which is being able to flip an aeroplane upside down and to fly through the clouds and experience just, you know, the most unbounded sense of freedom. That very first flight when I was lifted into that aeroplane, when I was learning to walk, I had no idea that it would become my profession. It was just that little glimmer of hope to me 
that after being in the spinal ward, when I first took the controls of that aeroplane, it just gave me that little bit of hope that I can do this. There is something in my life that I can do. And that was all I needed. Normal flying just too tame for you? Oh, too tame, yeah, far too tame. <laughs> So don't, next time you go on an airliner, don't let me up the front. <laughs> I've flown an F-18 and, and I've flown a small aerobatic aeroplane, which I used to teach in. And I have to say, flying the small aerobatic aeroplane is, is more difficult because, you know, the F-18 is a big machine and it flies itself. Mind you, it's a real buzz. I didn't plan on doing aerobatics. That just, that was the progression. You know, at first it was, you know, just lift me up and take me flying and, wow, this is amazing, you know, wow, I've got the controls, wow, I can fly, you know, and, and you know, gosh, how am I going to get through a medical, you know? Well, geez, I'll worry about that later. So just one step at a time and, I mean, if you're going to fly an aeroplane, you know, if you're going to bank an aeroplane, why not just keep going and go all the way around? Well, I can think of a few reasons. <laughs> well, I think aerobatic pilots make the best pilots because, you know, you're just so confident in an aeroplane. You know, if you're going to get into trouble, I'd rather be with someone that's a skilled aerobatic pilot. As it turns out, an instructor at the same school where you learned aerobatics was to become your future husband, Tim, who was later to become a Qantas pilot. Yeah, there was this funny little Irishman named Tim and, and, and we got on really well. And he was quirky and funny and made me laugh and, you know, we had a very... Uh, quick courtship, I guess, and it didn't take long for him to, to ask me to marry him. One of the questions was whether you could have children. Mm. I said to Tim, you know, I have to be honest with you, Tim, you know, the doctors don't think I'm ever going to be able to have children. And Tim, being Irish, said, well, there's really only one way to find out. And you did. <laughs> we did. <laughs> and had three kids. So, yeah, you don't realise, as I said before, you know, you don't realise how much you want something until someone says you can't have it. What made you ready to enter new relationships? What was going on? Because during your recovery period, clearly you weren't ready for relationships. You know, I had so much to deal with after my accident in terms of my physical body and my sense of being a woman and, and um, really understanding and getting to know my new body. So, you know, I wasn't ready for a relationship. And that was the period that I went out and I flew and I, you know, really established a new life. When I wrote my first book, I really had no idea of the impact it would have. I wrote it because I thought maybe somebody might be helped. If I had had something to read after my accident, I know it really would have helped me. I went in and approached a publisher and told them my story and I was really signed up instantly and sat down and just wrote Never Tell Me Never in around six months. It was published and it had an overwhelming impact. It was, you know, a complete surprise to me just how quickly it sold and how well it sold and the impact that it would have. It's probably sold a few hundred thousand copies now. It's been made into a movie. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. We're here to help you. I think we've got spinal injuries. Neck. Having a film made about your life is a very surreal experience because I actually got to sit down and look at all the audition tapes of the actresses that were trying Great, out for the role to play me. And, you know, none of them really jumped out at me until I saw Claudia's audition. 